we will now begin our next session. Yours truly, Jane Goodall, shortly. Dr. Jane Goodall, DBE, is an ethologist and environmentalist, founder of the Jane Goodall Institute and a United Nations messenger of peace. At the age of 26, she traveled from England to Tanzania and ventured into the little known world of the wild chimpanzees. Today, there are 24 Goodall institutions across the globe. She has received many awards and honorary degrees, has authored books for adults and children, and has featured in numerous documentaries and films. Dr. Manjari Prabhu is our next speaker. Dr. Manjari Prabhu is an award-winning international author and independent short film maker and also the founder director of two international film festivals, the Pune International Literary Festival and International Festival of Spiritual India. She has authored 16 books and is acknowledged as the first women writer of mystery India, mystery fiction in India. We will now watch a short film on Dr. Jane Goodall. In 1960, a young British woman ventured into the forests of Africa to follow her childhood dream, to find a way to watch free wild animals living their own undisturbed lives. She left everything familiar behind and ended up giving the world a remarkable window into our closest living relatives. She was me. I wanted to come as close to understanding animals as I possibly could. We are continuing our research at Gombe. It's the longest running study of any non-human animal. And we're using some exciting new technology to learn more about chimpanzee ranging patterns and the state of the forest. And this helps to inform decision makers on action to be taken to protect chimpanzees, their habitats, and the other creatures that live there. I flew in a small plane over Gombe National Park and I was absolutely horrified at what I saw. So quickly it seemed, the environment outside the National Park had been utterly destroyed. The trees had gone. The land was over-farmed and infertile. They were struggling to survive. And that's when I realized that unless we helped the people to improve their lives, there was no way we could even try to save the precious chimpanzees. This was when we started Take Care or Takari, our community-centered conservation project. Everywhere I went, I met young people who seemed to have lost hope. They all said more or less the same thing. We feel like this because we think you've compromised our future. And so that led into our program for youth, Roots and Shoots. The main message of Roots and Shoots is that every one of us makes a difference every single day. The program has now become a movement that's in 100 countries around the world. One of the things that the Jane Goodall Institute does that I feel is really most important is to try and give people hope, to help people understand that every single day we live, we can make a difference. And together with everybody making a difference, we can change the world. Hello, Dr. Jane Goodall. Hello. Sorry for all the technical glitches. Uh, it's our first online festival, and we are struggling with the internet. Uh, I know. But it's okay, everybody <laughs> does. Don't worry. 
It's such a huge pleasure and privilege to have you with us today. Such a huge pleasure. Thank you very much for coming here. So, uh, Dr. Goodall, we just saw this film. You have such, you've led such an extraordinary life. I mean, it's incredibly amazing. And it makes me wonder what kind of a childhood you actually had. I mean, I know, I mean, I've read that instead of playing with teddy bears as a child, you know, toy teddy bears, you actually played with a toy chimpanzee. So is that where it all began for you, the love for chimpanzees? Well, actually, uh, I was born loving animals. And it does so happen that when I was one and a half years old, I was given a stuffed chimpanzee. But I was born loving all animals. And as a okay. child, I spent all my free time outside watching the birds and the squirrels and I grew up during World War II and I grew up so long ago television hadn't been invented uh, wanting to learn more about animals all I had was books 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 and I loved books and of course um, I don't know in India if if people know Dr. Doolittle but I read about this this doctor who was taught animal language and then I met um, Mowgli, uh, the Kipling's Jungle Book, and he lived out there with the wolves. And then I met Tarzan, who lived with apes. And okay. that was when my dream began. When I was 10 years old, I will go to Africa, live with wild animals, and write books about them. There were no women scientists, actually not even men at that time doing that sort of thing. So everybody laughed at me. The reason I'm dwelling on this is because I might not have done anything I've done, but for my amazing mother, she's here behind me always, and she supported this love I had of animals. And when everybody laughed at me and told me I'd never get to Africa, it was far away, we didn't have money, we had very little money, and I was just a girl. My mother yeah. said, if you really want to do something like this, you're going to have to work really hard, take advantage of every opportunity. And if you don't give up, maybe you find a way. And I can't tell you how many people have come up to me or written to me and said, Jane, I want to thank you because you taught me, because you did it, I can do it too. And that's the message I've taken around the world, especially to disadvantaged communities. And it's my mother's great legacy, which I've managed to carry on. So uh, uh, this animal loving little girl, I did well at school. I didn't like school. I wanted to be outside. And when I left, I could have gone to university if we'd had enough money, but we didn't. So I did a boring old secretarial uh, course, got a job in London. Then came the opportunity, a letter from a school friend writing to me from Africa, from Kenya, where her parents had bought a farm, inviting me for a holiday, yes. Well, couldn't save money in London, so I came home. I'm talking to you from the place where I grew up, that family home. And I worked as a waitress in a hotel just around the corner there until I'd saved up enough money, return fare to Africa by boat, because it was cheapest in those days. I mean, there weren't any aeroplanes except very, very expensive ones. And so I arrived in Africa, I was 26, it was 1957, and was fortunate enough to meet Dr. Lewis Leakey, famous paleontologist. And guess what? I went to meet him at the museum, he was curator. And just two days before I met him, He'd lost his secretary and he needed a secretary. So that boring old secretarial was so useful after all. He gave me a job. He was very impressed by how much I knew about animals just from reading books. And so that led to him inviting me to undertake this. I mean, what an amazing opportunity not to go and live and with and learn from just any animal, but the one most like us, the chimpanzee. And so in 1960, as we heard, I set off, age 26, to the Gombe National Park in Tanzania. And at first, it was really awful because the chimpanzees, they're very conservative. They'd never seen what was virtually a white ape before. 
and they took one look and ran away uh, into the forest. And I was getting more and more depressed because, you know, yes, I was learning something through my binoculars. So it was David Greybeard, he's up here behind me as well, the first chimpanzee to lose his fear of me. And it was he who showed me that chimpanzees can use and make tools. He was using grass stems and leafy twigs from which he pulled the leaves to fish termites from their underground nest. And at that time, it was thought that humans and only humans used and made tools. That was what enabled the Leakey to get the National Geographic to agree to continue support for the research after the first six months money was gone, and also send a photographer and filmmaker, Hugo van Lauwek. And so when I'd been with the chimpanzees about two years, by then I'd learned a great deal. You saw a lot of that in the film, how they have gestures and postures similar to us and the long-term bonds between family members, males competing for dominance. They have brutal aggressive behavior, but also show love and altruism. And Leakey told me I had to go and get a degree. There was no time for a bachelor's. He got me a place in Cambridge University to do a PhD and I was very nervous and I got there and the professors told me I'd done everything wrong. I shouldn't have given the chimpanzees names. I couldn't talk about them having personality or mind or emotion because those were unique to us. Well, fortunately, when I was a child, I had a wonderful teacher and he's here with me as well. Uh, he taught me that in this respect, those professors were wrong was my dog, Rusty. We humans are not the only beings on the planet with personalities, minds, and emotions, something which indigenous people and many cultures around the world have always known. But Western science, possibly because of religion, um, they decided humans were separate. It was a difference of kind. We were isolated from all the rest of the animal kingdom. But fortunately, Hugo's film and my detailed observations, they had to change the way they thought. So that today, thanks to the chimpanzees, we now know that animals have so much more intelligence than we used to think, that they certainly have feelings. They can feel happy and sad. They can feel depressed. They can feel fear. And of course, they can feel pain. And that makes us think very carefully when we think how we use and abuse so many animals around the planet. You saw in that little film how I learned gradually the problems faced by not only chimpanzees in Africa, their numbers decreasing, their forests being cut down, but also the problems faced by the people. And so that's when I began the program to try and help the people find ways of living without destroying their environment. And this program, very holistic, Takari, has been so successful. It's now in six other African countries around chimpanzee habitat. And the people have become our partners in conservation. The bare hills I saw when I flew over Gombe in 1990 have gone and the trees have come back. Not quite as it was before, but the trees have come back. And so, you know, as I was traveling around the world trying to raise money for these programs that we had in Africa, I was meeting so many young people who seemed to have lost hope. And I wasn't really surprised because I was also learning what we're doing to this planet, the, the pollution of land, air, and water, the reckless burning of fossil fuels, creating these greenhouse gases. And the greenhouse gases are also increased every time we cut down forests and trees that releases carbon dioxide that they had stored back into the atmosphere. We're polluting the ocean, we're polluting the rivers, we're destroying the soil with chemical pesticides, fertilizers, 
and herbicides. And we're creating a world that if we continue to believe that we can have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources and a growing human population, this isn't going to work. There's apparently something like 7.8 billion, billion humans on the planet today. It's estimated by 2050, there'll be about 10 billion. And already we're using up nature's natural resources faster in some places than nature can restore them. So what's going to happen? I don't know. But when I was meeting these young people who said they'd lost hope, and they said that we'd harmed their future and there was nothing they could do about it. That's when I realized, well, yes, of course we're, we're harming their future. We've been stealing their future. We are still stealing their future. But it's not too late. There is a window of time. If we get together, we can start healing some of the harm that we've inflicted. And we can at least slow down climate change I've seen the effects of climate change all over the world, and you know about it in India. But nevertheless, that's when I thought we have to start a program for young people to give them hope, because if you lose hope, you fall into apathy and do nothing. And that was what was happening to our young people back in 1990. So in 1991, I began this program, Roots and Shoots, which is gradually moving around the world. And so it's just begun a couple of years ago in India, thanks to Shweta Hari. And so I'm inviting Shweta to come and say for a little while what is happening with Roots and Shoots in India so far. And I must say, I'm really grateful to Shweta I met her in Tanzania when she was with her husband before she came back to India. She told me how as a little girl, she'd read my story and wanted to go and study tigers. Well, she got married and that didn't work out, but she did get into the forest and she was out there alone at night hearing the tigers. And she has been such a staunch supporter and she's worked so hard, first of all, in Tanzania with Roots and Shoots and now in starting up Roots and Shoots in India. So Shweta, welcome. Thank you, Jane, uh, for such a uh, introduction. I'm so humbled and grateful to you. Uh, thank you, Manjari and PILF for giving us this opportunity to talk about Roots and Shoots. Um, the journey to Roots and Shoots in India began in 2018. As Jane, Jane said, that I was still in Tanzania and I was contacted by this passionate educator, Manjula, from Northern India. And uh, all found myself one day in uh, August 2018 in a big auditorium where she screened. Uh, Jane documentary, which came in, uh, from National Geographic. And here I was thinking in my head, an uh, auditorium full of uh, diverse people, as India is so diverse. In the second tier, Northern Indian city, everybody watched the documentary. And uh, in my head, I was thinking, what is happening? You know, what would be the response of these this audience after this documentary in which they see a young British uh, woman and uh, uh, and uh, Africa, which is two different cultures? Well, at the end, we got a standing ovation. Next day, Manjula took me to the village and uh, I was in this village school whose students came to watch the movie. And uh, this, the, then there was this particular group who came, who comes to me, and uh, there is this young girl who hands me over this beautiful card. She was a bit shy. I guess her age was almost ten or eleven, and uh, she tells me in Hindi, uh, "Madam, kal humne Jane movie dekhi, humko bahut achha laga. Jis tarah se Jane uh, chimpanzee 
आपकी सेवा कर रही थी हमको भी सेवा करनी है आप क्या मदद कर सकती हैं सो बेसिकली वॉट शी सेट इज दैट शी वॉच द मूवी दिस यंग गर्ल फ्रॉम अ विलेज ऑलमोस्ट टेन और इलेवन एंड शी वॉज सो इंस्पायर्ड बाय सींग जेन uh helping chimpanzees that she wanted to do something for the animals and she asked me can you help me and for me that was the moment and uh, that that uh, we are here today in india so what happened next with this young girl uh, it's a very interesting story that uh, while watching the movie she understood the interconnectedness of the nature so the very first project she came up along with the fellow students was uh, she identified a big area in her own campus it was a village school very big campus but in terms of green we we could see it was a very dry area and i was myself surprised uh to see the dryness in that area no birds like lack of biodiversity so this young girl took up the project and tells me that madam when you come next time you will see the change mm -hmm. then came the time for me to come back to india in 2019 i moved back along with my family and i visited the campus again i met this girl and you will be surprised with what i saw this was no more a dry land anymore they planted and planted and planted they nurtured the soil they nurtured the 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 land and i what i saw was nest birds 50 species of butterflies they identified themselves so that was the transformation which came in that campus because of roots and shoots and that is the transformation which comes with the change of the heart which happened from that one movie which the young girl saw and i am sure that there are so many young girls and uh, young boys young people in whole of the country whose hearts are getting transformed and thus their mind is led by the heart they are becoming compassionate leaders and doing projects and making a difference in their own communities we need your support so please do reach out to us and support us and create a better world for every living being thank you well thank you shweta and for the last few moments let me just say that we still are going through a terrible pandemic and the tragedy is we brought this on ourselves by our absolute disrespect of animals by creating unhygienic very cruel unsanitary conditions where we sell them in wildlife markets where we hunt them and eat them where we take animals from the wild and try and pretend they'll make good pets for people who want to show off because they've got a pet tiger or something and in all these situations we we create wonderful environment for some kind of bacteria in this case of a virus to jump from one animal to one person where it may create a new disease and in this time from a chinese wildlife market we got this new uh, covid-19 which unfortunately very infectious and has spread around the world caused untold suffering well we're beginning to show vaccines they're, they're being offered in the uk already we shall come out of this pandemic but then it's so important we must get together to fight a much more serious threat to the future of all life on earth and that's climate change and climate change was also caused by our disrespect of nature our stupid idea that we can have this unlimited economic development with these precious finite resources and the thing is that we 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 mustn't lose hope we mustn't fall into apathy we must get together and each one of us do our part and as i'm always saying i've got my four reasons for hope one is this incredible intellect we've been given we haven't used it very wisely but scientists have been working to produce these vaccines search for cures other scientists have been working on ways that we can live in greater harmony with the natural world india is a leader in moving away from fossil fuels into uh, sustainable 
renewable um, energy from sources like the sun and the wind and the tide. And also my second reason for hope is the resilience of nature. We can have a place that we've destroyed. And just like Shweta described that schoolyard, it can be brought back to life. If you give the soil time and maybe some help, we can restore life to our overused, poisoned soils in our farms. And animals on the brink of extinction can be given a second chance. And then the next reason for hope is the young people everywhere. Young people are changing the world as we speak now. And, you know, that the, they have so much imagination and passion and because they can choose their projects. Some of them want to help animals. Some of them want to help the environment. Some of them want to help each other. Everything's interconnected. And they are changing the world as we speak. And then there's what I call the indomitable human spirit. The people who tackle what seems impossible, but they won't give up. And they inspire others. And together, we can make the impossible possible. It takes a little longer. But we don't have much time. It's a very, we've come to a crossroads. And Roots and Shoots and all the people who work and work to try and change things around before it's too late, we need to support them. We need to get together. And we need to have a rallying cry, which started in Tanzania with the children who are coming together from different places. They ended up saying, together we can, meaning we can change the world. And I said, yes, we can. We know we can. We have the expertise we have, but will we? Will we? So now they say, together we can, together we will. And I've taken, when I was traveling around the world, getting audiences, and they would jump to their feet and say, together we can, together we will. So it's that inspiration, that little push that we all need now. We must not fall into apathy. And so I really look forward to knowing how Roots and Shoots grows in India. And then hopefully we'll have a Jane Goodall Institute in India. And uh, India already as part of our family can become a very, very significant part of the family with its growing influence in global politics. So thank you for this opportunity. Can you hear me, Jane? Now I can. Yes. OK, so I have some questions. I mean, or you've, you've mentioned all that I was already going to ask you. So, But I am very curious about three things which I want to ask you. Uh, one is, of course, that you are the first human being ever accepted in the chimpanzee society. I mean, I know that would have required a lot of patience and practice and understanding. But how difficult was it? And what does it mean to be accepted in a chimpanzee society? I mean, did you have duties? Uh, what, what does it mean to be accepted in chimpanzee society? I wasn't accepted into it in that way. Uh, OK. When I say I was accepted, it means that they no longer ran away from me. They realized I wasn't frightening. And so then I could oh. achieve what I knew I had to achieve, which was to sit very quietly and they would just go about doing what they did, which I could then learn about. Well, we made what we now consider a mistake and that was to offer bananas um, because today we don't do that sort of thing. But I was right out there in the very early days and the few people who were studying uh, some, some baboons in Africa actually, they had a feeding station, the Japanese with their monkeys, they had a feeding station. It was the normal thing. And it taught me so much because I could see these chimpanzees every single day. I got to know them like members of my family. And so it was, it was a very amazing time. And just as amazing was being out in the rainforest, especially on my own. That's where I learned that everything is interconnected that each little species has a role to play in this beautiful tapestry of life. And people who think that losing biodiversity doesn't matter, but it does because every time a species goes extinct, it's like tearing a hole in that tapestry of interconnected life forms. That's what gives us a healthy ecosystem. And whether we like it or not, we are part of and dependent on these ecosystems to give us 
well, everything, air and water and clothing and food, it all depends on healthy ecosystems. Yes, as you spoke about the rainforests and you've spent so much time in nature, you've also spoke, spoken about the great spiritual power of, of nature. And I'm going to quote you, you said that sometimes you feel as if you're being used as a messenger. So I'd love to hear if there's any special incident that happened in your life when nature overpowered you or you felt that you were being given some kind of a message. And I'm very curious about this. Well, I'm not sure that nature gave me the message. I do believe yeah. in a great spiritual power. And it seems when I look back over my life, it seems that there was a path laid out. And all I had to do was to make what I hope were the right choices at the different um, crossroads in that path, which has led me to where I am. But the moments in nature, those are what give, keep my spirit alive and revived and full of energy. And I remember one time when it was very wet and very cold, and there was a group of chimpanzees up in the trees. The sun had just come out after a long, long rain thunderstorm, and they were feeding in the evening. And I forgot I was wet. I forgot I was cold. And because I was on my own, I think, I just suddenly was part of nature. And I could see things differently. I could smell things differently. I could smell the wet air of the chimps. I could hear the insects louder and different and birdsong. And a little bush buck came right up quite close and didn't run away as usual, just calmly went on. And the spell was broken when the chimpanzees climbed down and moved off to make their nests. But it was an amazing feeling. I was literally at one with and part of the Gombe world. Can't hear. Can't so my, the, since we've, yeah, yeah, I, I am, yeah, I, I switch myself off so that you can talk clearly, trying to, yeah, make sure that you are heard, you are more important than I am. Yeah. So, uh, you, yeah. Than anybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the audience is all here to hear you talk and not me. So, uh, so you've been involved in research. This is something, this is a very personal query. Okay, you've been involved in, you know, research uh, on wild chimpanzees for over 60 years, but you've always said that dogs are your favorite animal. I mean, how is it that dogs are your favorite animal and not chimpanzees, and why? Well, first of all, to take the chimpanzees, they're so like people. I don't even think of them as animals. I mean, there's nice ones and nasty ones. There's some very nasty ones and some okay. wonderful, gentle ones like David Greybeard. Dogs, dogs are really special because when you bond with a dog, it's, it's like a true close, close relationship. And the stories about dogs and the relationship they have with people. I mean, dogs can be sought, uh, taught to work with blind people, to work with deaf people, to predict epileptic fits. Uh, children who are autistic, uh, when they're seated with a dog, learn to read because the dog is not judging them. And dogs are so faithful, and there's so many amazing stories of how dogs have helped people. And, you know, because of this pandemic, a lot of people have been isolated and locked down. And I know it was very bad in India. I suspect in India there have been cases of real depression because of this. And having a dog has really helped people to come through this kind of depression. Dogs can help people with post-traumatic um, uh, post traumatic syndrome who've been through war, for example. And so there's something about a dog. They've been domesticated from wolves for years and years and years, hundreds and hundreds of years. And for me, anyway, they're very, very special. For other people, it's cats. But cats aren't as domesticated as dogs. And I'm a dog person. <laughs> So am I. So am I. And that's why I asked this question. Uh, Jane, so much hard work, so much patience, so much endurance, so much traveling. Where do you get the energy from? I mean, you travel before COVID, you traveled for 300 days a year. And then now you travel for weeks on end. I mean, how, how do you have the energy to do all this? Where do you, how do you, you know, what motivates you and drives you? 
Well, you know, since um, the pandemic and the lockdown, I've been grounded here. I've been in this house where I grew up with my sister and her family since March. I've had to be virtual, Jane. And that means every day sitting, gazing at the laptop as I am now, talking to a little camera seated, seated up at the top. I've had to learn to give lectures uh, virtually. And, you know, when you walk into an auditorium with five, 10,000 people, there's so much energy and there's a lot of feedback. People laugh and they clap. Uh, but when I'm talking like this, there's nothing coming back from an audience. And it's been very, very hard. So I used to get a lot of energy from the audience. I get a lot of energy from young people meeting them, seeing their projects, or even hearing about their projects. That gives me energy. And some of the amazing people I know around the world, you know, they're so inspirational. And then I do get energy from this great spiritual power, call it what we will, that I, I just feel uh, is behind the creation of the universe. And you know, we can say the creator, we can say God, we can say Allah, we can say Krishna. It, it doesn't really matter. It's just that spiritual power that some of us feel so strongly. I get energy from that. I know because sometimes when I was at my tiredest, 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 I can't give another lecture and I'm sitting there in the green room. And so I just open my mind and I give some of the best lectures of my life because it comes into me, so I know that it's true. Wow, absolutely inspiring. Uh, Jane, I think you've followed your heart, okay? And you've led a life of your cho choice, I believe. You've done what you wanted to do. You've received many awards and honors for your work, and your work has been recognized. Do you feel a sense of satisfaction, or is there something that you felt you should have done? Are there any regrets? I mean. Can you comment on that? Well, I don't think I could have done much more than I have done. So that doesn't worry me too much. Of course, you can always do things better, but I don't think I was capable of doing better than I did. Maybe I was, I don't know. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm now 86, nearly 87, so I won't have that much longer. Don't know how long it'll be, can't tell. I mean, you can always be, the plane can be shot down or you can get COVID-19 and pass out. I mean, we never know. And there's so much left to do. And I know that I can't achieve it in my lifetime, but my, my you know, the driving forces, I want to get this message out as widely as I can before that dying comes. Uh, the fact that each one of us, we all have that indomitable spirit. We need to let it out. We need to realize who we are and what we can do as an individual. And when you have a collective, a, a collection, maybe millions, hopefully one day billions of people all trying to make ethical choices in how they live, then we get to a better world. The trouble is that's not going to be easy. First of all, we've got to alleviate poverty because when you're really poor, you're going to destroy the environment to try and live, cut down trees to make charcoal, or to make space for your crops, or you're in a city, you're going to buy the cheapest food and clothing, but you can't afford to ask yourself, uh, did its production harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of sweatshops or child slave labor, the things we hear about? Um, you just have to do what you have to do to stay alive. And we can't ignore population growth and the growth of our livestock. And it it's, you know, I explained that, but these billions and billions of sentient beings, animals in these factory farms that are in so many parts of the world, they all have to be fed. That means clearing land to grow the grain, fossil fuel to get the grain to the animals, the animal to the abattoir, the meat to the table, using precious water. And I know in parts of India, there's real problems because of drought, because of climate change. And it takes a lot of water to change vegetable to animal protein. And um, then 
these animals in their digestion produce methane gas. You know, we all do. And that's, that's a very virulent greenhouse gas along with CO2. So moving towards a, a vegetarian plant-based diet, and that I know is, is very common in many parts of India. It's actually increasing around the world, luckily. Yes, that's really important. I, I myself turned vegetarian for compassionate reasons, and I know lots of people who already have. Uh, Jane, there are many interesting questions here, and uh, we'd like to take those, if you don't mind. Uh, quickly, uh, we're just going to scroll. Um, OK, just a minute. Uh, do you think humans are intelligent or just clever and selfishly consumeristic? <laughs> a lot of humans, I regret to say, um, they, they're not using their intellect in the right way. And it's this consumerism, this materialistic lifestyle, this abandoning, this believing that we can live without nature when in fact we can't. And that's why I always make a distinction between the intellect, which is clever, 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 and intelligence, an intelligent person would understand uh, that we can't continue living in this consumeristic way. And that's why Roots and Shoots is so important because there's an awful lot of ignorance. People simply don't understand very often. I mean, I honestly, I know people in China who thought that elephants shed their tusks and everybody laughs and says, oh, that they can't really think that. But they've never seen an elephant. They don't have education in the schools about elephants. These deer shed huge antlers each year. So why wouldn't an elephant shed its tusks? So behind a lot of the destruction of the planet is ignorance. And then the rest of it is this consumerism, this materialism that you mentioned, and this crazy belief or or desire to have unlimited economic development. And unfortunately, we have to do something about corruption. We have to do something about some of our leaders who perhaps don't lead in the way that is best for the future generations. What has been your biggest learning? Well, my biggest learning, oh my goodness, um, I try and learn something new every day. And I think what I love learning about most is how amazing and intelligent animals are. And so, uh, for example, we talked about factory farming and millions and billions of pigs are in factory farms. It turns out pigs are as intelligent as dogs. And you can actually look up on the internet this pig who's called not Picasso the artist, but Pig Casso. So everybody listening, look up Pig Casso. And there are three little videos that pop up. And one of them has the yellow border, which is the geographic uh, sign. And you will love what you see. And so many people have looked at that video and said, oh, I can never eat bacon again. And it works better to show people how amazing animals are than to show all the cruelty that goes on because they don't want to look at the cruelty. They don't want to think about it. So they close their mind. But if you show them something wonderful, then it goes into their hearts. And I feel that only by changing heart can we actually get this change of attitude, this different mindset that is so important for the future. The message, what is the one message you would give children? Yes. The message is the same as my mother gave me. If there's something you really want to do, then you're going to have to work really hard take advantage of every opportunity and don't give up. But the other message is to please remember every single day that you live, you make an impact on this planet and you can choose what sort of impact you make by how you live, 
how you interact with people and animals and the environment. And so the last message is please find out about and join our Roots and Shoots family. It is a family. It's spreading all around the world. It means if you go to a country at any time and you know nobody and you find a group of Roots and Shoots, you found your family. I've been told this again and again and again. So join us in Roots and Shoots. And I know Shweta will love to give you all the information about how you can start a group in your school, in your community. It's very easy. It doesn't cost you anything. Dr. Goodall, I would like to end with one of your quotes, which I think is very, you know, very, very relevant today. And after all that you've said, the quote is, here we are, the most clever species ever to have lived. So how is it we can destroy the only planet we have? And with your work, you've already you know, made all of us think. And the next question for us is, what can I do to stop the destruction of this planet? And I'm just hoping that, like you said, that every person makes a difference in, and we have to make sure that the difference is positive. And I'm sure that's the message everyone's going to take back home. And thank you so much. It's been such a privilege having you here. I'm sorry for all the glitches and the ups and downs and the internet. Uh, well, so, but it's been a huge privilege and thank you so much. Well, thank you. And we have to remember, don't we, that the intellect without love and compassion is no good. So when head and heart work in harmony, then we can all achieve our true human potential. So thank you, Manjiri. And thank you, Shweta, and everybody who's put this together, the Literary Festival, yes. books, 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 so important. Read books. And thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>